Well, welcome everyone. Welcome back to Ohio University. Welcome to Alden Library. I'm Scott Seaman, Dean of Libraries, and it's a real pleasure for me to open this session uh, featuring Carl Walker, author of Soulful Bobcats. Um, Mr. Walker isn't just an author of, of Soul for Bobcats, he's also a contributor to Black America, a state-by-state -state historical encyclopedia recently published by Cleo Press, uh, in which he contributed the Washington, D.C. entry on. After graduation in 1956, Carl Walker worked for the Social Security Administration until retiring in 1986. He then became an adjunct professor in the Department of Public Administration at Atlanta University and later a professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at Clark Atlanta University. Our host this afternoon is Doug McCabe, Curator of Manuscripts in the Mond Center for Archives and Special Collections. We welcome also all of our online audience as we are broadcast webcasting this live with the help from our friends at WOUB Public Media. Thanks also go out to the Ohio University Alumni Association and, of course, the Black Alumni Reunion. I do want to remind everyone that books are available for purchase right in the corner. I understand Mr. Walker might be available afterwards to sign copies. If you would like, for our web audience, we encourage you to go to your local bookseller and buy a copy there. Thank you very much, and Dr. Mr. Walker and Mr. McCabe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Here we go. Good. Welcome back to Ohio University. I know you've been here several times, lots of times more recently than uh, long ago, perhaps, but we're you know, thrilled to have you back. Soulful Bobcats. And let's get the rest of the title for all of you here. Experiences of Amer African American Students at Ohio University from 1950 to 1960. Where did this concept come from? Where did the idea come from for the book? The idea of the book actually is a natural progression of the aging process. <laughs> <laughs> we had had our we had had two previous reunions of this group, and in preparation for the third reunion, my idea was that we're getting pretty old and we're losing our schoolmates rather rapidly. So the idea was perhaps, <clears throat> let us do our children and grandchildren a favor of letting them know what we were like, what we experienced during our years, because almost universally we had such expressions of pride and joy and happiness of our years at Ohio University. And I really felt that it was the kind of thinking that would be treasured by families for generations to come. Well, there were, uh, as it ended up, a total of 18 people who contributed to the book uh, as autobiographical uh, sketches, and then there were other people too who helped put the book together. Um, should we maybe point out some of those people? Excellent point. First, I would like to point to my co writer, Betty Hollow, whom I was fortunate in meeting at the uh, third Soulful Bobcat reunion. And after a little encouragement, she agreed to. Uh, give me a hand with this book. So I'm deeply indebted to her for the assistance, particularly the research and the uh, history that was available here at Ohio University and in this library. But I'm even more indebted to my fellow soulful bobcats, my uh, uh, friends for life, uh, eight of whom are here with me sitting on this front row and uh, I would like to mention them by name, Ada Wood, uh, Lois Green, Ada Woodson, Alice Rush, Joan Neighbors, and I'm gonna skip over the next one for a moment, and then Elva Jane Johnson, Tracy, Frances Walker, my wife, and then Dorothy Lou Sands, to whom the book is dedicated, oh. and 
Uh, the book is also dedicated to Howard Nolan, whose widow is here with us and sharing his spot. So I'm deeply indebted to each and every one of these, and along with the uh, roughly 10 fellow students who are not here with us today, uh, they made excellent contributions to the story and allowed a framework of our experience to be established based on their individual experiences. So I'm very proud of them, and so much credit goes to them for their writing. Yeah, let's give them special credit. The whole front row, very lovely looking ladies. Yeah. All ladies, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the construction of the book is um, really so much the autobiographical reminiscences of these 18 people. And then there are the, you know, there's a preface and so forth, you know, Roderick McDavis, President McDavis uh, wrote a piece for it. And then there are, I guess we could, might call them bridges between, to kind of bring you up to speed on each person and a few comments in between to help people understand where, where the folks were coming from and, and, and what got them going here and so forth. I was really struck by, and I've read this book two times, so, you know, I do remember some of it. <laughs> but I was really struck by some really common elements that everybody experienced as well as their individual experiences that were special to them. And I think maybe my next question would be, what were some common elements about being here in that decade of the 1950s? I think the most common element that we shared was that each of us, regardless of whether we were from the North or the South, actually had experience with racial segregation. We knew it, we recognized it, and we were quite cognizant, and our own mores and behavior were largely shaped by those experiences that we had had and those of our parents. Now, it is not that we liked it. As a matter of fact, uh, as you look at the progression of history, you can see that the flaming resentment was really intensified during the 1950s uh, when African-American soldiers who had fought uh, in World War II, having gone to places like Europe and seeing a relative social freedom there, and then having seen the wounded and dead of uh, African Americans there and come back home and say, well, that's what we fought for, to come back home and endure this kind of segregation. So many of them became college students uh, in the 50s, particularly the early 50s, and uh, it was that feeling. Veterans did have a lot to do with uh, intensifying the resentment to racial segregation because they had seen another world. Now, we as students uh, had a double obligation, one to our parents and who had sent us here and expected us to do well and behave, and that code of ethics was universal. That again was another of the characteristics of our generation. And we had an obligation to ourselves, to be ourselves. We were a group of ambitious uh, young African Americans, and we really felt that we could make a difference uh, in the lives of our children, uh, and that we greatly appreciated what our parents had done, but we really were hungry for more. Well, this is another thread that I think that's uh, very important that, that shows up, I think, with really everybody who contributed. And that was their, their, their familial background, their families, their parents. And it's just something, I don't know, is it, was it across the generation or, or just special for you all and your parents for that, that desire for more education, more out of life? We were, we were truly blessed to have had such a focus on life. 
And it's somewhat tragic that subsequent generations have not been able to focus as clearly as we, because the obstacles and difficulties uh, are different. Uh, in our day, as I mentioned, segregation was real, and we knew it. And it was fairly easy in comparison to even devise your own goals in the face of the reality of that time. And you could keep them realistically. Now, uh, for example, it's, uh, if you look at the majors that we uh, pursued while here, you'll see a heavy indication, particularly from the girl students, of education. Uh, we were in the age where uh, many black uh, professionals uh, were teachers, mostly women, and uh, uh, many of the uh, men and women black were finding small openings in public service, federal, state, and local governmental entities of one type or the other. And with that along with the uh, traditional professional classes of medicine and law and religion, theology, they sort of uh, circumscribed uh, where our lives were going to be, even being educated. However, we were beginning to feel the thought and threat of saying it's not enough. We want to be engineers as well, uh, as Howard Nolan so uh, aptly demonstrated, and his story is quite touching in that regard about his determination. And to hear that we lived those conversations, we were very close socially. As a matter of fact, I would say that our group of students were closer than most family units I have observed in recent years. And a lot of thanks goes to Dorothy Lusanne, to whom the book is dedicated, for maintaining that feeling over the years after school we were aware of each other's families and children and where they lived and promotions and so forth. And our reunions became a centerpiece of which I'm very grateful to Ohio University for allowing us to reestablish that ideal life we had here in Athens. And we uh, just cherish that. And thanks to Ohio U. We'll always cherish that. Well, we're glad to hear that. One of the things I think that's been talked about a lot about that generation of college students in the 1950s, as in comparison to the later generation of, say, the 60s and the 70s, when the, that, those generations uh, were here on this campus and other campuses, uh, a lot more vocal, a lot more upfront and in your face kind of thing. But I, I look at this book and reflect on other things that I've read. And I see that there were numerous barriers being broken down in the 1950s that really set things up for the 1960s and the 70s and beyond. More educational opportunities, more business opportunities and career opportunities in the 1950s that were in some ways really just what quietly done. You know, government jobs, yes, but coming to state schools, for example. Um, we have, embarrassingly, in our own Board of Trustees minutes from the 1920s, uh, a controversy that brought on the president of the university at that time, writing and saying, well, we want in the Board of Trustees uh, policy that no one can come from out of state to Ohio University who is not acceptable to a state school in their home state. We all know what that means, don't we? And when that was challenged, the president of the university actually wrote a letter to say that we're not interested in becoming a Negro college. And it was because of people like you from West Virginia and people from Kentucky and Tennessee and the state of Virginia itself and so forth that he said that. You know, I mean, it's a terribly racist thing. But 20, 30 years later, we're starting to see more and more African Americans and the people of color coming to 
colleges like Ohio University and making some inroads for accommodation for that to happen. And I think you all made a lot of that nice experience on your own. You know, well, not that you were really challenged that much. You know, in, in other senses, you were, of course. You know, thank you for bringing that up because there are a couple aspects to that. That particular effort by the administration at that time uh, really was, as you point out, aimed at preventing ne Negro students, which was the term in common at that time, from attending Ohio University. Yet there's a certain irony if you look at the composition of the student body, particularly during the years around 1919, 1920, 1921, and even enough to bring an African American fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, to the campus. Uh, and I looked at the birthplace of a number of those. I was surprised to see how many West Virginians, for example, African Americans, were in that group. So the first point that I would uh, suggest in that particular edict that was passed was that it was half-heartedly uh, uh, enforced, apparently. And the second aspect of it, it is my understanding that that has never officially been rescinded, that it is still in effect. And, I think we need to uh, talk to some people about that. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I think that uh, while the numbers and the uh, uh, progress that has been made, particularly by my favorite president, Dr. McDavis, uh, uh, this, this has just been so wonderful to have lived in over this period of time and to see what has truly happened. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I think that while there were variances in variations in the implementation of that edict, uh, it was not enough to truly impact uh, the uh, admission of African-American students as a movement as such. <clears throat> and I think that was really good. Now what has happened and remained uh, problematic throughout the 1950s were certain other vestiges of uh, segregation. As you know, and I'm sure you are well aware of the number of incidents that we face even with uh, attitudes of professors. Uh, in my own story, I recount uh, a relationship with professors whom I cannot attribute it, that experience to anything other than racial. Uh, and there were other people who had various other forms of behavior uh, exhibited by professors, the attitudinal. But we were able to somewhat discount that uh, as an impediment to getting our education. That was just that guy. As a matter of fact, it was a certain irony in my own experience that the professor that I referred to had a relative, I don't, don't want to identify it even more, but had a relative who was also my guiding teacher in education for whom I've never had a closer working relationship and a more positive one. And I was able to do student teaching in the Plains. Now, that, there was that other law yeah. that was passed which was designed to prevent the education majors from teaching in the Athens school system. Uh, and uh, many, like Alice Rush here, went back to Cleveland to do her student teaching. And I'm not sure whether she was told she had to go back or whether it was voluntary, but it was not uncommon to have that experience. But in my own case, I went to the Plains High School and the uh, leading professor told me he was so comfortable, he allowed me to teach his class for a week. Lois Green, though, she was one of my students over there. Uh, 
for a week while he took another class on a field trip. So the experiences were varied here, and they across the board. There was not uh, the thing of a rigid segregation system that was clearly a uh, southern base here where the answers were no. You do not go here, you cannot go here, you cannot do that. But here at Athens, we had a number of circumstances for which race was the central point and the central theme. And again, as I, my own, forgive my reference to the personal experience again, but uh, as an adult, I look back at how close we might have come to sparking a little racial incident by my uh, roommate and I stopping at a bar here on Court Street to have a drink after a meeting and so forth. That, uh, that had all the ingredients that sparked later riots and yeah. conflict that uh, we were served the drink. But then the other patrons, and particularly couple of Ohio University students who became rather vociferous about our presence in that bar. And uh, so it's a part of the story that I tell, but uh, that was a reality. We found comfort in each other. Our natural instinct was to share the experience and get either talked down or further infuriated by our <laughs> peers, whatever yeah. it was. But uh, they shared the emotional reaction to the incident as we had felt it. And of course, as you get older, those are the learning experiences of life. But we kept our focus, our eyes on the prize of getting a college degree. That was very important to us. Well, and speaking of that incident, I, you know, I. To, to, to follow it through, uh, you came back to the dorm to, to <laughs> explain to a few of your uh, uh, fellow students what had happened, and a group of you went back up to uh, exactly right. to the bar to, <laughs> to deal with that little situation. And uh, I guess everybody was maybe lucky that uh, the perpetrator of that problem um, was no longer in the bar. Um, but I think there's something very important about that as well is that. I wondered, as I read that, if 10 years earlier, that same incident, how that might have, how it might have gone. Would you have been allowed to, to, to have been served a drink in the bar in the first place, and then when confronted uh, with, a, with you know, vocal racism, and then go back to the dorm and tell people about it, 10 years before, would, would a group of people said, uh, you know, no, we're not going to have this. We're going to go up and confront this guy. So that's that's another example, I think, of a transition thing going on. Yeah. In the 40s, it would have been, oh, let this one go. Uh, in the 60s, it would have been, uh, okay, fine. We're going to, you know, we'll find somebody to pound on. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know. that's true. So now, John Baker was president for the entire decade Correct. when you were here. What? Give me your impressions of John, and, 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 do you, and what do you think he was as a president and, and from the viewpoint of African Americans on campus at that time? I'll speak personally, and I think it's a comment that uh, later on my colleagues would have a chance to speak on. But um, I found him to be uh, charming, delightful, and friendly. He walked the campus, he spoke, he smiled, and uh, very welcoming. I was more impressed with who he really was as I read, uh, as I learned earlier and read the account of Frank Underwood and his relationship with President Baker and President Baker's own attitude and desire for uh, integrating the athletic teams here and I thought that was a very wonderful story, and uh, uh, no doubt about it, it endeared President Baker to me a great deal, knowing that particular experience. But otherwise, I knew him as a nice, kindly, polite, cheerful looking man, but uh, during those days, one did not get to 
dialogue with the president of the university. <laughs> that, that, that's been one of my real thrills of the current president is my uh, get a thrill out of talking with him 101. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, one of the things that uh, was so wonderful to see how President Baker and Frank Underwood divide the communication system uh, that was very helpful, and I doubt that my fellow students were any more aware of that than I was at the time that it was going on. Well, I remember from John Baker's oral history that he, uh, he talked about when he was, uh, he, he recruited some students from Africa, and he wanted to make sure that they were welcome in the community and could operate in the community and he went to the local barbers and said, now look, you know, I know there's a problem here with, with uh, uh, our own African-American students getting haircuts and I, and I want you to promise me that these African students will be able to get haircuts in your barber shops. And um, the first response was no. And John said, that's not good enough. And he finally talked them into it that they promised to do so. And then he saw these students later on on campus and asked them, now, are you everything okay? And can you get haircuts? And they said, well, yeah, we can go to the barbershop and get haircuts, but we're not. We're cutting each other's hair. And he said, why? Did, were you treated poorly? He said, no, it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, in earlier sessions uh, during this reunion and it's in prior ones, and um, you know, it's certainly brought up in the book. That was one of the things was how to uh, get hair care uh, as, a, as an African-American. Mm -hmm. it, it requires some, some special talents on the part of those who are uh, caring for their own hair as well as those who uh, are professionally trained to do so. And it's pointed out very clearly in the book that uh, you had to go to the plains to get haircuts, and that was from a, a really an amateur Lois, no. And Lois is green father. Ah, okay. Your father. Oh, okay. So, yeah, all right. Good. So, um, that's just one restriction that uh, wasn't so much an Ohio University's restriction by any means, but it was a, it was a, a town, a, a regional I, uh, restriction. I'm not sure that, oh, uh, that, oh, uh, perception of President Baker's was uh, consonant with our experiences. Our experiences was that the barbershops would not cut your hair. Uh, and I'm not sure what it sounds from that incident that you described or your conversation with President Baker, that that might have transpired uh, even before I arrived here in 1954 but um, it was fairly clearly known that you cannot get your hair cut in the barbershop. And uh, in the class before, one of Dorothy Lou's roommates, who was a very fair complexion young lady, uh, actually went, the stories in the book about her going to a, a shop here, uh, and not being recognized as being African American and, and was served. But uh, the point of that time was that we could not get our hair cuts here. And even in relationship to the experience at the bar, uh, my roommate and I very carefully analyzed which bar had been reputed to serve African Americans. It wasn't just a happenstance that we went into that bar. We had assessed whether there was an opportunity to get the drink if we went in the bar. So there were the remaining, there were questions about uh, being served if you were to go into specific beauty parlors. And to my knowledge, during our day, it was very firmly established that the barber shop here in Athens would not uh, cut your hair. And, uh, and that, in all honesty, I think most African-American males, certainly of that age and generation, 
we're not really desirous of non-African Americans cutting their hair. So that more than the cost might have been a subtle factor uh, because if you get a haircut, you want it to look nice. Now, people who are not experienced with your style and your hairstyling and so forth, it, it becomes a, uh, uh, a defeat to your purpose for going to the barbershop. So, and they're wielding very sharp scissors. It, exactly. <laughs> that, that's exactly true. Yeah. So, well, the other thing that I noticed, too, with that, with that episode or, or the discussion of that kind of thing with the, with the, the hair care for the men in particular was... Um, something that turned out to be actually an enjoyable experience because everybody would go together up to the plains to get their hair cut. Yeah. They met some nice people up there. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> <laughs> Who met some nice college boys. <laughs> you know. So you can make something you know, sure. nice out of something that's a little disappointing as And well. even for those of us, uh, I, I recall going to Parkersburg two or three times, it turned into a social event when we would go to Parkersburg to get our haircuts there. Uh, we, uh, of course, could, we couldn't go into the nightclubs there, but the American Legion, the African American American Legion was certainly open to us, and we were very familiar with that on, <laughs> on campus. And there were a couple of us that had automobiles. Now, automobiles were not prevalent among the uh, student body of our day. But um, I was fortunate enough to go in with a couple of guys, and we bought an old car that would run around campus, and uh, we had a little bit of fun with that, <laughs> driving around. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I got a wife out of the <laughs> 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 We won't talk anymore. Well, it's... Well, another thing that I think that, you know, when it comes to campus, uh, you all kind of took over the, the bunch of grapes around, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, the bunch of grapes room was ideal for our needs, our purposes. And in truth, I did meet most, including my wife, there in the bunch of grapes room. Um, so it was our favorite spot. It had a couple of characteristics that truly were quite appealing, even in retrospect, look at that. Number one, it was convenient. Number two, they had integrated the jukebox uh, I was wondering to about have that. had at least four or five songs that we really wanted to hear and that we could dance to. So dancing being a favorite sport that we would engage in, it was, a, it was always uh, in the African American community, one of the uh, entrees to a good social evening is uh, in, have the music and dancing. So uh, the convenience of it, and yet in truth, we did not seek to make it all black. I think that uh, the fact that it did turn all black was mostly either out of deference by a fellow white students saying, well, I'll leave those guys alone with what they're doing, or they might have even felt uncomfortable being in there. But we felt very comfortable <laughs> being in the bunch of grapes room, and it was like home, and we could uh, truly depend on having a bit of social uh, interaction on a daily basis there, so it was a great thing. Somebody's always gonna be there. Someone was always gonna be there, and you could play bid whist, too, which was a, another favorite pastime that we had. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of interesting little side story, I was amused when uh, my co-writer, Betty Hollow, asked me, well, what is bid whist? No. You know, I, I said, well, it, it's an aspect of a cultural thing. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for those of you who don't know, it's a card. <laughs> Thank you. That's about all I know about it. So what were some of the songs that were on the jukebox? Do you remember? Oh, yes. Uh, Bill, Rachel, Night Train, Bill Doggett, Night Train, Bill Doggett, and um, uh, 
Chubby pretty little as girl well. yeah. twist, yeah. chubby checker. Um, oh, my favorite was, uh, and I've not even told my friends this, but I've told Francis the thing that I was so enamored with was a song called Earth Angel oh, by the Pink Clan. Yeah. And that was my song, yeah. my date there at the... You probably sang it to someone special. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't sing. That was not a talent. <laughs> oh, you, uh, you mouthed the words. Yeah, certainly, I did. What, now, with, with Count Basie and Nat King Colby, too? Yes, yeah, yes, no, they, they, they were. Too. Yes, yes, that was... Nancy, Nancy Wilson, Wilson was a kind of local. She came down from Columbus to sing for us at our party. Nancy Wilson? Nancy Wilson. Wow. Now, I heard earlier that you had a, there were a lot of parties at the Armory. Was that it's your time? Well, we were not later. at the Armory. Those young folk that uh, came later on went to the Armory. Okay. We went to the Knights of Columbus. Uh, KFC. Okay. KFC. Yeah. Okay. And usually they were Alpha Phi Alpha sponsored event. Mm -hmm. Very often they were. Um, and of course, uh, there we attended a number of the dormitory parties, uh, uh, the Vought Hall parties and so forth, and the, uh, the military ball and J -prom. J Prom. So we did attend uh, uh, on campus parties and so forth, but uh, there were uh, the parties that were held sort of off campus at the night at the Knights of Columbus Hall. Okay, okay. Did now did uh, Alpha Phi Alpha have a, a house at that time? No, no. Okay, so they just no. kind of doing what uh, President McDavis was talking about in the earlier session of making uh, what wings or areas available for. Or well, I guess maybe you all would have been just wherever. Yeah, we were we were scattered uh, as far as dormitory uh, assignments. Uh, first of all, um, this little anecdote. Um, I was always fascinated after graduation with the notion that Ohio University might have had a um, quota system for African American students. And I really believe that because I began to count the numbers and it looked like it was around 1%. And then as I advanced in my career and became a manager and saw how you had to deal with organizational problems and say, I began to think that if there were a formalized quota system, it has certain advantages for the university. Number one, the difficulty of housing could be addressed with a small percentage of a special population and with the number of dormitories that were here, by being accepted to Ohio University, we were virtually guaranteed of housing and did not have to participate in that lottery for housing as mm. white students did. Mm -hmm. So we really did get favorable treatment in that regard. And it was essential because we couldn't get to housing through the community for the size that we were. Right. And then the second thing, second advantage that I felt was good for the administration was that uh, they could hold their heads up high nationally and say, we do not discriminate. We have African-American students at our school. So the reputation was clearly established there. That it was an integrated school. And the third advantage administratively that I would see is that in the event of this order, this social disruption and so forth, it would be far easier for an administration to handle a, a smaller student population, minority population. It just lent itself more to an element of control. Now, even that incident that I mentioned, the story of mine, I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the part where I mentioned our uh, my roommate and I going to see the Dean of Men mm -hmm. the following day to report that uh, incident to the university. And uh, of course the outcome was really kind of interesting and tricky, but uh, it, yeah. it turned out well. Uh, the outcome did turn out because myself and two other veterans of military service were able to get a little apartment under the washeteria 
on East Mulberry Street there. And uh, so we lived in our own apartment. And I'm almost certain that the thought was maybe we could, I could put you guys separately. You're a little, old, you're a little older and uh, susceptible to fomenting difficulty with younger minds. I'm not sure what his thinking was. But. Well, a little older and know how to use guns. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Veterans of the Korean War, yeah. right? Well, I remember years ago talking with Frank Underwood and Charlie Wilson that, uh, of course, they were both the first two uh, African Americans to get full ride scholarships uh, to Ohio University through football. And they're trying to get off campus housing and having a terrible time doing it yes. because nobody would rent to them. And I also know, uh, having talked with Vern Alden, how he came uh, after your, your generation uh, had moved on, that uh, he had decided he wasn't going to put up with that, that anymore, that uh, segregation, uh, well, or just, you know, non-renting to African-American students. And he uh, announced that since they had control over um, approved outside housing, yeah, remember that? Yeah, there was both approved yeah, and unapproved, good. okay? That if he went to the people who own, the landlords who own the, the approved outside housing and said, you cannot, you can no longer discriminate. And he said one woman in particular was just absolutely irate. <laughs> but uh, he also said we had to keep on it. We had to keep following up and asking students to make sure, uh, you know, when you make that phone call, are you, are you being served okay or not? Because if, if you're not, then we're going to have to get on these people again. So he was very serious about making, making changes with things. Um, you all didn't get to experience that, but it, I think, was also that sort of transition period of, of allowing things to move in a better direction. And I would like to think uh, that a part of that would do to the adherence of our group to some standards of conduct and of, uh, of scholarly pursuits. I mean, really and truly, I'm sure that if there is one thing that as a group we represent, it was a kind of seriousness of purpose of being here. And as E.J. said in her bit, that uh, we could not disappoint the people who sent us here, you know. We, we had that obligation and all of us felt that. It was a generalized feeling and uh, the idea even in our social lives, we could uh, explain our woes and problems and get a little help uh, uh, and strength from just talking and sharing with each other and that's probably why we did grow so close. We became uh, Inter, in, in, interdependent on each other for uh, a hardships or shortage of money or whatever it is. We were, we were in this thing together. So there was a very strong bond. A strong uh, set of goals. A from, strong set of goals. Yeah. And, it's, and especially, I think, uh, now I, you know, I was wondering when I was reading this, you know, I wonder what the graduation rate was for African Americans at Ohio University during that 1950s. We tend to Nine, yeah, in the ninety percentile. Yeah, uh, doesn't surprise me in the in the least, and it's that parental and communal closeness. It's the personal drive to to succeed. To that's, I mean, that's impressive. Yeah. Ohio University likes to make a lot uh, these days, as it should, of a very high graduation rate throughout all of our commu student communities. But over 90%, that's, that's incredibly impressive. Yeah, we even expected each other to graduate. I, 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 I can't imagine a conversation that Dragon we would have right. saying, uh, <laughs> hey, I can't make it here, I can't do this, and so forth. But we were all interested, and uh, each year we saw who was leaving, and uh, uh, some you cried, well, most we cried over. <laughs> we were close. Well, that's one of the things, too, that I think we as a university now take a lesson from, you know, with our uh, 
our, our residential learning programs and so forth with, with your experience, you know, by having this tight group together. Everybody's helping everybody else out. Everybody's encouraging everybody else. And that's so terribly important. And it, it means so much. Well, my guess is, is that that really kind of came from your own backgrounds as, as children within your own families? Uh, yes, yes it did. And um, I think the, the beauty of it, though there was a variety of background and circumstances that we came from, um, no indications ever seemed to have ever uh, arose where there was any indication of class or, or status based on family or anything. We were completely devoid of that. And in a couple of the biographies, uh, my fellow uh, students commented on having their first experience with a white community that would make big issues over variations in religion and so forth, and girls not being able to date boys of a different religion. And so uh, they were fascinated and puzzled by that because that was not a part of our culture. I mean, you would hope that the boy or, the boy or girl would be religious, that they were brought up in uh, family training, but, uh, and of course, most, uh, most of us could relate to old Baptist training, yet a high percentage of us, if you'll notice in that book, uh, I was surprised to see how many of us were attached to the Episcopal Church here in Athens. Mm -hmm. I know my wife was, Joan was, Dorothy Lou was, um, Claire, well, a bunch of us, and if you'll notice, the participation in the Canterbury Club, well, again, was a major social outlet for that group. Uh, and in all honesty, I became an Episcopalian because I was pursuing a young lady who was an Episcopalian, <laughs> and I finally gave me extra time to go to the Episcopal Church. So I honestly became a, an Episcopalian right here in Athens at that church. Was that, was that church especially welcoming? It was. It was. It was very well. As a matter of fact, it has been understated for its welcoming. And, and they can uh, tell you the story. They sang in the choir. They were members of the Canterbury Club. I know Francis went on a couple of retreats to Cincinnati with uh, the Episcopal Church and so forth. And a little interesting sideline, I found it so, so, so interesting to me was uh, in the Episcopal Church you have to have these lessons to become an Episcopalian. And I, uh, in my day, and I remember many skirts were just coming on the scene. So one of the guys in my instructional class asked the priest that, well, uh, uh, Father, how do you feel about these uh, students going to wear these mini skirts, you know. And he said, well, I feel the same way that you would feel. He said, however, I'm trained to resist the, the, the kind of thoughts that you might have. <laughs> he said, but I have the feeling. <laughs> so I said, that's my kind of man, you know. <laughs> and so I became an Episcopalian, <laughs> along with the fact Along with the fact that I, uh, I found that he also could drink beer and smoke a pipe, so that that sealed the deal with me. So the miniskirts weren't too distracting <laughs> that, from, from him. the Lord. Really. <laughs> well, one of the things I remember with miniskirts was uh, my my favorite class was French class because half of the class sat f with in chairs facing the other half of the class. <laughs> So, you know, a much better view of many <laughs> I say, you are progressive. <laughs> yeah. <they st> <laughs> well, that's, you know, another thing about community here, and, uh, and that community that um, is, is university community, but also the community, the town gown thing. Um, now, there, there, there was another church in town, the Mount Zion Church. It, which was very popular, too, with our group. Uh, of the uh, predominantly white churches, I, I'm not aware of any uh, that attracted as many as the Episcopal Church did. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether 
there was a Presbyterian or any other faith. It does not seem to, from my own awareness, that uh, more, you know, Marley and the several who are not here who were Episcopalians there, and uh, Burl, uh, many of us who were. So, uh, and it was kind of strange, but it seems as though uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church was also, now that was a real big deal for us. Matter of fact, that's where my roommate and I were coming from when we stopped at the bar. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> coming from a church meeting. <laughs> so, Safe haven. Yeah, right. it was. Yes. It was, a, it was very, and and I went there. We went there. Uh, the Episcopalian students went there mm -hmm. to uh, church and activities. So Mount Zion was quite popular with us. MIAs. Um, at that time, was it still called the Men's Independent yeah. Association? Yes, yes, it was. Okay, because my time, it, uh, that had fallen away, and they just called it Movies in Auditorium, uh, which is they didn't have to change MIA. Oh, right? that's interesting. But uh, movies were twenty-five cents. Yeah, twenty cents. Twenty cents. Twenty cents. Well, it went oh. up then in the, by the late nineteen sixties, but. Still a great place to be able to go. Now, these were not first-run movies, of course. They were already a year or two old, but wow, but to great us, entertainment. They were fresh to us. They were fresh-looking movies. I remember seeing The High and Mighty and uh, there. Gone with the Wind. Well, pardon me? Gone, Gone with the Gone Wind. Gone with the Wind, yeah. Let's draw it up. Foreign films. Let's draw that Italian film. Foreign films, yes. okay. And a nice dark auditorium. You could sit next to somebody important. <laughs> you perceive very clearly of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was a way. You know, you talked about how you know, like with the university, um, and, and your suspicion of like, say, like a quota system. Uh, I confess, I, I've read a lot of you know, university records and things here. Uh, in the archives, and I don't recall seeing anything like that. But then again, I wasn't really looking for it, and frankly, I doubt if that would have been written down. To be, I, I, doubt I think it. the lesson was learned from the twenties about what you write down and what you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that really started to change with Vern Alden in the nineteen sixties. So that was a, a, a nice thing to see. Um, I, I can say, as a as a freshman in nineteen sixty nine seventy. I had a black roommate, so and that was not as one of these things where, you know, uh, pick your roommates or any of that kind of thing. We weren't allowed to do that that year. Uh, we did the we were all allowed to as sophomores. So, um, and frankly, that was my first experience being close to someone who was uh, from a very different background. It wasn't just that he was black; he was from Queens. My God, you know, it's like wow, this is really different. <laughs> For an Ohio boy, um, and but but okay, let's let's go back to that decade of the fifties. Um, was it really always the case that African Americans roomed with African Americans, and that's the, that's the way it was? Yes. It was the first one that had a white roommate, and that was we had to ask our parents if it was all right, and it was only for one semester because we both lost a roommate who got married. Uh, and we were in center dorm, we were in honor storm, and we had to get per, per, uh, permission. And we were the, white, the first ones that were had you know, it was interracial. Okay, so for those of you listening on the web and might not have heard all of this, we have a barrier breaker right here, and you know, who had a, a, a white roommate, and uh, and center dorm was an honor storm, and was Baker Center, right? Yes, it was. Yes. As I had talked to John Baker about that, he knew that he was going to have a terrible time getting um, financing to build a student center. And they decided early on to make those upper floors dormitory rooms, as we used to always call those things back then, uh, so that they could get financing from the state for that. And then, of course, years later, all those rooms were turned into uh, offices for student organizations and so forth. Because you ate all your meals at, at Baker Center as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you might notice, too, a couple of uh, the bios indicated the uh, experiences with uh, attempting to have interracial roommates. As a matter of fact, there was one account of where 
the university person said that they would call the parent of the white girl uh, to see if that would be acceptable. And of course, that's an obvious slap to the black girl that you take what you get. You know, I right. mean, you take right. what we give you kind of it. So that sort of experience was offensive uh, and uh, would not be done, of course, to, in today's world. But uh, those, uh, that kind of response was not seen as being so out of line back in the 50s, even though it was. Uh, yeah. But uh, to give that kind of impression that we'll call the white family and see if they will permit their daughter to a uh, room with an African-American student. That's kind of in loco parentis with a twist, isn't it? it I mean, indeed, you know, because it is. Of course, the, all That's women right. on campus had hours. The men never did. <clears throat> I don't, still never figured that one out. But um, And well, then there were things like, uh, didn't, there were certain evenings you had to dress up yeah. for dinner. Yeah. Yeah, and then the whole the whole thing about with women's hours was just it was more than you have to be in at ten o'clock on the week nights and was it midnight on the weekends maybe, but you had to sign in and out of the dorm if you were going to go home, <laughs> and uh, I just heard a story uh, another day or so ago that um, one woman got caught up in a snowstorm up in Columbus and had to get um, an excuse from the railroad company and hand it in to Margaret Deppin so that she didn't, <laughs> she didn't get points or whatever it was. Well, I'm getting the high sign from the back that we need to open things up to the folks out in the audience here and on the web. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to direct to us or to everybody else, you're more than welcome to do so. We have I would here. like to, oh. if you would ask um, my fellow schoolmates to turn your seats around so you can face the or audience. Or you can stand up. And uh, any questions that come that you feel you have the information relevant to that question, please do answer it because you have had as much or more experience at, a, at Ohio University as I have. So this is a, these are contributors to the book. Their biographies are part of the book, and it would be good to hear their voices as well. Thank you. Okay, so to the hand that, that was up. Oh, I was just going to say that I enrolled in 1959, and at that time, we were assigned um, by race. So that was a So the, the comment was that in 1959, students were assigned by race to dormitory rooms, but by 1960, it had changed. Okay, and that, I guess, means, too, that when you uh, signed up for um, a, a, a dorm room, you had to disclose your race, exactly. right? Exactly. Sent a picture. You sent a picture. Sent a picture. Okay. It was before race was on. It was before. And Frank Underwood is back here. Catherine, to come on. We're asking Frank Underwood to come and sit with the ladies, and he's yeah. he doesn't appear to be very well, reluctant. Flat has not a, a one of the writers of <coughs> Francis B. All of these schoolmates were contributors to the book, and their stories are in the book. Yes, ma'am. Yes, well, you were talking about the bunch of breaks room. Uh, I started in 1960 and graduated in 64, and during the time that I was here, there was some kind of a racial incident, which I'm not really sure what it was. But somebody made a comment because of the record, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Remember that? Remember the song, The Lines of Sun? The fact that it was an African village. And somebody made a comment, like in the student newspaper editorial or something, about, you know, there were 
maybe there was an African village here on campus because all the black kids sat in a bunch of breaks room. Well, the reply to that was something like, um, well, maybe that's true, and maybe you don't want to walk through that room because you don't want to wait those sleeping lines. And that was another editorial that was in the student newspaper at the, at the time. So mm -hmm. the whole bunch of great, and then it turned out, and then it started to be called the bunch of apes room. Yeah. And it was called the apes room by a lot of Grant Latimer, Dr. Latimer. Yeah, but he, he didn't Well, there wasn't a question with that, It was, but that's fine. Uh, but for the web audience, I'll uh, try to paraphrase that uh, it's definitely between 1960 and 64, the bunch of grape room was still being used by a lot of African Americans, and there, was, there were rumblings of things, uh, particularly around the song, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, and then things slid into racial slurs by calling the bunch of grapes room the bunch of apes room. Um, I'm hoping that didn't last very long, but I'm not sure. You know, it, and I don't, in my own time, in the late 1960s, um, I don't recall the bunch of grapes room being considered just for African Americans, but I could be wrong about that. I didn't spend a lot of time up at Baker Center, so. Is there acknowledgement of uh, Nolan's building of the new Baker Center over at Baker Center? Yes. There's a yeah. Plaque. Okay. But they don't know who he is. A lot of them don't know who he is. Well, we'll we'll make a call to the post and make sure that they <laughs> have, they publicize that. Carl, there's one other thing, and when he talked about um, uh, President Baker, I was talking. Uh, with Wiki today, and she told me something about President Baker as far as haircuts, and I think she should share that uh, with us. Um, I, I was really in like high school or maybe middle school, but uh, President Baker realized that there was a need. He was always aware of, of things that were that the African American students needed, and he found out that some of the students weren't able to get their hair cut in town, so we lived at the Plains. So he drove out there and asked my dad if he would take the responsibility to make sure that uh, African Americans that came there got their hair cut. And so he did it for quite a few years. And I also understand that uh, President Baker was uh, a facilitator for affording some scholarships and he was an anonymous donor. The recipients, and Yvonne Spotswood was one of my, was my roommate. She was not aware of the fact that she was, uh, who her donor sponsor was. She went to an academic, uh, Walnut Hills High School in and since Cincinnati. Then. Mm -hmm. So she was a very strong academic student and she was given this uh, award. And I understand three other people received those awards but they were sponsored by Dr. Baker. Very important. Fletch. 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 Grant, Grant. <coughs> one other comment on the haircutting uh, situation. There were two black barbers here in, in the city, and uh, they were members of the uh, Baptist Church. And uh, when we went down to get our haircut, they worked in a white barbershop. Uh, they told us uh, they were not allowed to cut our hair. 
and wondered, wanted to know why. They said it, it would make the business bad. So what we decided to do, and that's because that's when the fraternity got started, the alpha, by alpha fraternity reactivated it. And uh, we took the money out of the treasure. And a couple of the other brothers had gone down and gotten their hair cut. And these barbers, who were better barbers probably than anyone in the city, kind of messed over their hair. So we took the money out of the treasure, took 21 guys down to the barbershop, and said, we thought you needed to practice. <laughs> 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 said, once we got, he said, we, we, we thought you were going to spread the, the business around. So we, we were going to do that, but once you messed over some of the brothers' hair, we decided you better better do some some practicing. So after that, we had no pro no problem. We always did in, uh, insist that we come after five o'clock. That's when all the business, the white business, had, had uh, terminated. If I may, back to Dr. Baker for a moment. Carl indicated that. Uh, the reality is he and I did have a special relationship, and that is that uh, I uh, and Charlie Wilson, another football player, were the first two blacks to get athletic scholarships here. So when I came on campus, Dr. Baker communicated with me and invited me to his house, which he did continually, well, as long as he, I was here, because I had left before he did. And he would just ask me how things were going. But at our first meeting, he told me how it came about that I was there. And he said he was playing at a football game. And he didn't see any, as he put it, colored players. And he asked somebody, he said, how come we don't have any colored players? And he said, they gave me a bunch of garbage. And I said, get some. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was from that that athletic scholarships were made available within the next year or so to Charlie Wilson and I, and I don't know how many others. But uh, that's the way we got to this university, mm -hmm. to Dr. Dr. Baker. Mm -hmm. And he done a, did a lot of things, such as what you were just talking about, something he didn't even know about. But that's the kind of man he was. But he made a, a tremendous influence on this university because, as a result of that, many more black students came from the areas where these athletes came to a high university. And that continues today. Because students are looking, well, what do I want to go to college? And they say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so who happened to be an athlete went to that college. So many more black students are enrollment rooms from that point on, and uh, the university still benefits mm -hmm. from what Dr. Baker did. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I do want to say that the year that we came was uh, Frank graduated in 1954. Uh, 54. We came in 1954, and I think also, and, and there was a lar much larger number of African American students who came in 1954, I think, that had ever come. So I think that, mm -hmm. that, that Dr. Baker's influence carried over there also. And the, um, there were a lot more women who came a lot more young ladies, because I understand that prior to 1954, I was told that the young men would meet the buses <laughs> on the first, as people were coming in, to see how many African American ladies were going to get off the bus, because there were some very few. But the year we came, there were more. There was a larger number than there had ever been. And I'd been. like to say that all the women who were here during that year, never wanted for a day. <laughs> Everyone was asked to every dance. There were never an African-American girl sitting in the dorm wanting for a day, <laughs> ever, ever. Grass was green. That's right. <laughs> so Carl, will you be signing books for folks? Yes, I'll be happy to. Okay, great. Okay, so we're ready to wrap it up. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. And for those of you uh, tuning in on the web, thank you so much for watching and listening. And it's been a, a great pleasure for me to uh, host this uh, get-together with Carl Walker. And everybody go out and buy Soulful Bobcats. 
They're, it's available at all of the local bookstores. Um, if it's not available on Amazon, write to Amazon and tell them it needs to be. And uh, it's just, it, like I said, I've read this book several times. It's an excellent book. It, it really fills in a lot. And one more thing, I'd like to challenge those people who are of the decade of the 60s and people of the decade of the 70s and people of the decade of the 80s to get together and do what Carl has done with all of his fine friends here and let us know about the history of African American students at Ohio University during those decades. I think it would be a wonderful contribution all the way around. So with that, thank you very much for coming. Proceed. Books available. Proceeds? Yes. Uh, very importantly, the proceeds from the sale of this book is to the Urban uh, Scholarship Program. So it is very important. It has nothing to do with the writers of the book in terms of getting any kind of royalty. It is the book was written by these fine people with the intent of making it meaningful to students at Ohio University. So all the proceeds of that book will go to the Urban Scholars Scholarship Fund. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.